All right. So welcome, everybody. Tonight, we are going over potential partners and reaching out um, for the Fulbright grant. And we are recording this, so we will be placing that online for future reference. And um, I'm going to start by putting a few links into our, um, into our, oh, hold on just a second. I'm going to change my view here. Oops. Apologies. We're going to exit full screen. And I'm going to share these links with you about um, sort of a summary of what our presentation today goes over. This is a PDF of today's presentation. And then this is a PDF of last week's presentation checklist. Um, and then also afterwards, we'll share a link of the presentation in general. So if you want the links that are embedded in the slides, um, that will be available as well. Um, so those are some things to check out. And I do have an announcement that came out just today that um, Fulbright is delaying the start of the 2020-2021 uh, programs until after January 1st, um, just because of the COVID-19 happening. So that's just something to be aware of that delays can happen, but Fulbright seems really committed to all of their fellows and making sure that it still happens even if it's on a delay. Um, so there are three types of Fulbright grants. Um, and this was a, a detail we added after last week because there was a good question about students, non-students, and these three types of grants sort of clarifies that question. So number one, there is an open study research grant for scholars. This is the traditional award opportunity um, where a candidate designs a proposal for a specific country um, and you would have at least five years of experience as an artist or a designer. You've been out of school for at least five years. There's also the English Teaching Assistant Award. This is where you'd be placed in a classroom abroad and you would provide assistance to the local English teachers, um, not uh, art specific necessarily. So if you're looking specifically for art, you would skip that one. And then there's also the student program. And this is a, a kind of broad umbrella. The student program is also open to those who are outside of school up to five years. Um, and that could be an English teaching opportunity or um, a scholarly research project, an artist project. Um, so when you're thinking about which program you'd like to go into, uh, you'll want to ask yourself, do you want it to be art focused or not? And ask yourself, how close are you to your academic experience? If it's outside or beyond five years since you've been in school, then you would go with the open study research option. Um, more information on that scholarly research option. There are many variations of that. So there's the classic six to 12 month option. Um, and then there's also the Fulbright Flex Awards. And these allow scholars to propose multiple stays instead of one long stay. Um, so that's something to check out. Not every country has that. Um, so you'll want to use the search tool on Fulbright's site to um, to check that out. And these are clickable links. So you can just um, click that when we send out the, the um, presentation. Also, there's the Fulbright Postdoctoral and Early Career Awards. Um, and the title says it all there. So that's something to check out as well. So um, as a note, if you need help with a project idea, last week's um, presentation was on brainstorming. And this is a clickable link to that brainstorming checklist. Um, and that brings us to our topic for today. What is the letter of support? It's a letter from a host. Um, and they agree to provide you things like mentorship resources, um, possibly a desk, maybe access to a library, depending on what type of host it is. And why? Why do you have to do this? It seems perhaps a little cumbersome. Um, and the reason for that is Fulbright requires at least one letter of support um, when you apply. The maximum would be three letters from three different institutions, but you do have to have at least one. It's an exercise in professional networking and a test of your resourcefulness. Um, so it's sort of like a pre-screening process. Fulbright sees it as if you're able to solicit 
and successfully gain a letter of support, then you might be um, someone to seriously consider on their end. Um, and it also shows that you've thought your project through. Somebody not related to Fulbright is willing to endorse your idea. They see it as a feasible idea. Um, and I'm seeing a comment here. Does that impact due dates? Good question. Um, I have a feeling this was about the question about um, Fulbright changing the, the dates for the 2020 2021 season. I have a feeling it, it possibly could, um, but their website would be the place to check out all dates um, for the most up to date information. Um, so, who can your partner be? Um, your partner can be many different things. Um, probably the most common is a university or college um, or a conservatory in the case of the arts. Uh, the, the catch is, though, it should not be an American university that's simply located <clears throat> in a different country. It does need to actually be a, a domestic to that country institution. Um, and then also, obviously, museums or galleries would be good places to try, foundations or nonprofits, think tanks, uh, research organizations, sometimes a government agency or NGO can be a good partner, libraries. Also, because um, most of us are artists looking at this, you can also get a letter of support from an artist or a musician or a writer. Um, and also media agency could be a suitable partner as well. So um, each country has its own requirements. You will want to check out what your country requires. And in part, because some um, countries will find the affiliate for you, which is super convenient. And if you don't have to do that legwork, you certainly uh, wouldn't want to do it if you didn't have to do it. Um, so check that out. Um, some countries and some awards will only allow you to affiliate with a university or a laboratory. So again, just really check those details. And how, how on earth do you obtain this letter of support from strangers, um, people who you probably don't personally know? Well, you'll want to start out by giving yourself plenty of time. Um, this can take a really long time, um, especially considering that Many schools and organizations close over the summer and they take those closures seriously. They actually do unplug and um, it can take a long time to get a response. Um, also, you'll want to check the country's guidelines. I know I say that a lot, but it's because each country is totally different um, in terms of what they're looking for. And the best strategy is to have a colleague introduce you to somebody that's not to say that you can't do cold calling or that cold calling doesn't work. It's just that if you do have a connection, take advantage of it. It will make your life so much easier. Um, they're much more likely to respond if you have somebody in common. So if you do have that opportunity, take advantage of it and do reach out to those people with whom you've already got some sort of connection. Also, if you're having trouble thinking of who to contact, return to that brainstorming list for contact ideas, and that can be a good way to um, build up your, your list of possibilities. So um, how continued is um, think about organizations or individuals that you've heard about um, related to the topics you're interested in. And do any of them do the type of work that you want? An example that I saw online that I thought was really good was um, this was a person emailed anthropologists and asked them for the names of Mexican ethnomusicologists and radio producers. So if you can think of um, people you can get in contact and ask for their reference, then you will have a built-in connection when you reach out to the person you actually want to affiliate with or the organization you actually would like to affiliate with. Um, also, talk to former fellows. Um, use that Fulbright search tool on their website to look for fellows that are, one, have been in the country that you would like to go to, and two, um, fellows who are in the same area of research as you. And then three, also uh, at MCAD, we're super lucky to have a bunch of um, fellows on faculty, on staff, and they are really generous people who would love to have a conversation with you. Um, so if you're coming from a different institution, seek out those connections at your own institution as well. Um, a lot of institutions have a fellowship advisor. 
Um, at MCAT, it's Jessica Dandona. So you can uh, reach out to her in addition to all those other fellow past former fellows. Um, also, a really great connection is think back to um, when you were in school, if you're already out of school, or if you're currently in school, to the international students that you knew um, or currently know. And they will be good connections and have excellent ideas of who you might can connect with. Um, also, just generally alumni from any academic institutions that you've been at um, and faculty are really good resources. So um, other things you can do if you find a connection and you don't think that you have any one in common, LinkedIn is a really great site that you can visit. And if you look them up on LinkedIn, you might be surprised to find that you actually do have somebody in common with them. And that can be really helpful. Um, also, if you're really stumped for ideas, you can think about what are current events that interest you, um, that you're, you'd like to follow along with. Um, or if there's a particular country, what priorities does that country have? And that might lead you towards a good affiliate. Um, also, other ideas, you can look up the authors of journal articles or books that interest you. Perhaps they might have a good connection. Um, and also consider location of organizations in terms of size, political leaning, workplace culture of the organization that might be your host. All of this can guide you towards someone or some, uh, some organization that is a, an excellent fit for your needs. So at this point, let's assume you have a list of potential partners and you should have a list. It's, it's actually important that you have a lot of options. Um, so you'll want to really take advantage of that brainstorming and get a lot of ideas. Um, and then start out by prioritizing this list. Where would you most like to partner? Um, all the way down through all the other options and then start at the top and email someone from the first two to three organizations on your list. Try to get a personal introduction, as we've already mentioned. You can use LinkedIn to try to find those common connections. Um, and if you have no common connections there, it's still okay to reach out to them. Um, you can direct your email to the highest level person at the organization, such as an executive director, um, if it's a small organization, or um, if it's a larger organization, they might actually have a research program and you can reach out to um, a leader in that area. So uh, writing the email, it can be intimidating to reach out to people you don't know. So we've got tips here. Um, keep your email very short and concise in, at this introductory stage. You wanna capture their interests, but not overwhelm them. Include Fulbright in the first sentence of the email and in the subject line, that will usually grab somebody's attention. Um, so don't be afraid to put that right at the top. Um, and then the, the key components of that email are a very brief introduction. They don't need your life story. Um, just something like, I'm a recent photography MFA graduate from MCAD or whatever your information is. And then attach a resume so they can get um, that one page summary of who you are and they can continue through the email quickly. Um, state which award, award you're applying for and include the URL so they can click it, they can see it's legitimate. Um, state that you're seeking a host and what that time period is, and state the general research areas and programs you're interested in, and close with a request for a phone discussion or a, a further email correspondence in the near future. Um, also, don't forget to ask if this is not the correct person to reach out to, can they please refer you to someone else that can help? Um, you'll want to keep those ideas broad in general because sometimes that connection at the organization might have an idea that you hadn't thought of. So being open to flexibility is a good approach. Um, also acknowledge their work. It can't hurt to, to sort of uh, make a cheery pitch and say, you know, I've really enjoyed X, Y, and Z about your work. Um, and it may help to offer to do something for them in return, such as volunteering at the organizations or tutoring or um, being a conversation partner at their university. So response times. Um, you will want to allow at least a week to respond and follow up with a short, polite email or call. Um, don't be afraid of the phone. A lot of countries, um, 
might not have the same email um, response times that that you might encounter in America. And so sometimes a phone call can actually be more effective. Um, and there will be people you never receive a response from. That's normal. Don't take it personally. Um, some people just aren't interested. And that's why we have a healthy, long list of, of options that you can reach out to. Um, and yes, as I mentioned, many cultures don't have an expectation of rapid response. Um, or they might not have internet access that's very reliable. So um, remember that if they do respond, they're really doing you a favor um, and they're not obligated to respond to you. So you'll want to be really conscientious of that. So upon following up, let's say you've made a contact. Um, you'll want to offer to send them your project statement or a rough outline. And we're lucky to have Frenchie here today. She's going to talk about that um, after this presentation. And this outline or statement will give them all the details they need to write their letter. Um, make sure that the expectations you have are very clear and that you both agree upon them before you move forward with the letter. Um, for example, if you expect to have a dedicated workspace, say that and make sure that they agree to that. Um, similarly, are you expecting to teach classes or workshops or have access to a library, a particular schedule? Make sure you state that so that everybody's on the same page from the get-go. Um, also, some fellows work with their host every day, and that's fine. Um, others might only meet or email with them every few months, and that might just be to, to touch base and find further contacts or resources. Both models are fine. That, that works totally okay, um, but you want to be aware of what your expectations and their expectations are from the start so that there isn't a misunderstanding down the line. And the letter of support. So this is um, sort of a nice little checklist of what you want your letter to include. Um, it should confirm that the host will be available during uh, the grant year, or if it's a flex grant during the, the grant timeline, and that they will be available to supervise or mentor um, according to the project. And you'll also want to include, or the host should indicate their understanding of your project and be able to speak to the feasibility and the validity. Those are two things that Fulbright is specifically looking for. Um, and they should show enthusiasm for your work and your willingness to work with you on this intended project. Um, they should indicate how they'll be involved um, and what you'll bring to their organization or community. Um, so if you're going to be using any equipment, um, let's say you're at a printmaking shop or something like that, they should indicate how you'll be using the facilities or if there's material needs, um, class workshop fees, um, exhibition costs, etc. If they're going to be covering any of those costs, they should indicate that as well. Um, they might not, and that's okay. Um, each country is completely different. And indicate if there are any other resources or contacts that they'll provide for your support. And finally, confirm, if, if necessary, because some countries do require this, um, that courses proposed are held in English or that the host country language courses um, and support are available. So a little bit more on that letter. Um, it does not have to be long and it doesn't have to be stunning. Um, it just has to be a few clear sentences that cover those topics. Um, do ask that they write it on institutional letterhead and um, they must receive a hard copy um, with the original signatures. And if you get a letter written in a foreign language, you have to have that translated into English <clears throat> and both the original and the translation must be uploaded to the application. Um, and then this page is just some links that you can click on when you get this presentation. And then also there's a whole bunch more links um, of what I looked at to create the presentation. And without any further ado, I'm going to exit um, full screen and I'm gonna make Frenchie into our presenter. Just one moment here. All right. So Frenchie, when you feel ready to share your screen, go right ahead. There. 
Okay. All right. Can you see my entire screen now? I can. Yes. Thank you. All right. So um, I'm basically doing um, sort of the fill in and doing the examples of um, what um, Ellen so well covered in terms of, um, uh, you know, achieving these partners in your uh, in your task of doing this kind of thing. Um, first and foremost, um, I've been asked to sort of like look at this sort of Are you still there, Frenchie? Because um, I'm lucky because I've been in Japan a lot. I know a lot of people there. But when I went the first time, I knew no one, no one. I barely spoke any Japanese. I actually um, applied for it thinking I never would get it. And then I got it, right? So it was one of those things which um, I had to sort of play by ear. Um, and so what I have here on the left hand part of the screen here is the, um, you can get a downloadable guide to filling out the application and I suggest you do it. I literally went through it page by page. It takes a long time to fill out this, um, this thing. And the project details you see uh, listed there are, these are things that you have to upload. And these are things that you develop outside of the actual application and then upload them in place. And so I'm going to be talking about the letter of invitation and the project statement. Because as, as Ellen was discussing all of these things that have to be cleared with your um, proposed associate, with your po uh, proposed um, uh, institution or person that you're going to be working with, the project statement states all of that. And one of the things you do is have that, pro that project statement ready to send to these people. So it's one of the first things you need to work on is the project statement. Um, but I'll also talk a little bit, um, a little bit about the two other kind of aids in doing this. And one of them is the recommenders. And then the other is, of course, the advisor, the person that, that helps you that, that uh, A, finding them and then B, working with them in terms of getting that letter of invitation. So here's um, what they say about the recommendations, and these are literally from um, the form. Um, three recommenders, no more. They'll just hit one off. They will not accept four. Um, so you need three recommenders. And so what you need to do are think about three people who you can be very sure that they write well. One of the problems sometimes is, is somebody who perhaps is, uh, speaks another language, but they don't write in English very well, and it doesn't come off well with the committee. You need people who can express themselves well. So a lot of times teachers are probably the best bet. And that they have a background with you to give this kind of um, recommendation and offer to give them your resume, offer to give them a, um, a PDF of your work, um, uh, and um, a backgrounds and so forth. And you can give them your project statement too if you have it written ahead of time. Like this is one of the reasons why I say that project statement really will inform them and to as to what you want to do. And then also you have to ask them, would you be able to give me a good recommendation for the Fulbright grant? If you don't know that, if you have a teacher, you're not sure whether they really even know who you really are because it's a big class, ask them, are you able to give me a good recommendation? Because you do not need a bad recommender. Obviously, that's not going to work. So you need to just straight out ask them and be honest and say, if you can't, I completely understand. I just need to know, right? So here's mine. This is, I, lit, I wrote this to um, two friends, uh, Takuki and Mari. They're a married couple, but they both are key in my area for different reasons. A lot of times people don't even know that they're married. Takuki uh, Tatsumi is um, one of the big connectors in my area. He is a teacher of American studies um, at, I think, at Tokyo University. He is very well known all through Japan and a lot of the United States too. Uh, he's um, very fluent in English. He is a connector of people. He got me connected to everybody the first time I was in Japan. 
um, and made my life a lot easier. So I wanted him to write me one because he's very eloquent in English and he knows my uh, work. And Mari Kotani is one of the key feminist uh, critics uh, sh on shoujo manga uh, and other issues, but mostly shoujo manga uh, in Japan. So she's very well known. She's um, a key person. And I've known her as, as long as I've known Takuki, which is like a, over a decade. So I wanted both of them. So first of all, I start off with something personal. Psycho Gang is Takuki's um, jazz band that he's had with these guys since junior high. And so, you know, we could go listen to jazz uh, frequently with him and we're listening to Psycho Gang. Um, and he had sent me some photographs. So I talk about that. Then I say, I'm in the process of writing a Fulbright grant application and need written recommendations. I would like it if you two could write me one. Um, my project is one I started years ago having to do with my fascination with shoujo manga and shoujo culture in Japan, its relationship to feminist works that I've been reading, and really about the drawings and styles of shoujo manga. I was obsessed from my first look in 2008. So again, what I've done is given them, asked them for permission, told them what kind of thing, you know, one, two sentence thing about what I'm going to be studying. And then I say, if you agree, the Fulbright will email you a submission URL to load your recommendation. Also, I will send you a more detail about my plans and my project statement. If I get it, I will be there in Tokyo for mostly nine months, so I will get to see Psycho Gang, right? So this was just sort of a, a, a thing. And then I say, if you cannot do this, please know that I totally understand. I can find other people, so don't be afraid to say no. To be very front up about you know, the possibility that they may have feel, even though they like you as a person, they may feel like they can't entirely recommend you. You have to give them an out so that they can be comfortable in getting out because you don't want somebody who doesn't want you. So those are the two, um, two of my uh, three. So letter of invitation and choosing an advisor. This is a uh, key moment, actually. Um, and if you notice number four in project details, it says host institutions consult the award description to determine if a host institution should be entered in this section. If you're doing any of those categories that Ellen um, put up as potential categories, you will need a host institution. And that's why you can start uh, one of two ways. You can start about thinking about the advisor that you want to work with in that host institution, or if you uh, really want to go to a uh, major university, uh, as I did because of the manga museum they have, which is terrific, then you know that really sharpens it. And then who do I know there, which I do know people there. But that's not the way I started. I Placing them where they were in Japan, looking at that area, what's in that area? Do this has lots of manga stores? Does it have a manga library? There are, in point of fact, 17 manga libraries in Japan, so I had a good choice. Um, and uh, then I would look at the area. How uh, easy is it to get around? Do they have lots of subways? Well, of course, if you're in one of the major cities, you do have subway um, action. You can get around pretty easily. Um, what is the housing in that area? Is there is it a safe place for me to have housing there? Um, I looked at um, the adjacent kinds of, um, are there um, shoujo manga ka, people who make ma uh, shoujo manga in that area? And of course, it very quickly became uh, clear that I had to be in the Tokyo area instead of my adored Kyoto. Um, there were a couple people there, but one of them is a kind of a psycho, and I don't need that. Uh, the other person person is, uh, is not someone I know very well, and I would have to take the train in and out of Kyoto the whole time, and it would take a long time to get there and a long time to get back, and so that wasn't a very good choice. So then I'm in uh, Tokyo, 
And right away, I kind of knew what I had to do because Meiji University has a brand, their uh, manga library has just been redone and there are lots of, it has a very great, huge collection um, in both languages. And they, um, and my one of my good friends there, uh, Yukari Fujimoto um, is a professor at Meiji. And so I wrote her and here is this that my lead line is possible Fulbright advisor, just as Alan suggested, putting Fulbright up there will perk them up. But I mean, Yukari would have answered me anyway. How are you? It's been so long, blah, blah, blah. The reason I am writing, and I see I misspelled am, double check before you do that. Uh, the reason I'm writing is to ask you if you would consider being an advisor to me as a Fulbright scholar. I am required to have an advisor and a university base of operations to apply for the grant. So I'm telling her straight up what I need. I would be in Japan from July 2020, not happening, needless to say, to approximately March 2021, although it may return uh, several months earlier than that. I'm writing about the shoujo, uh, the work that I have been preparing for for several years, you seemed like the perfect advisor and it would be fun, right? So I then I tell her, I'm finishing a book on cosplay this summer, which I did, but we'll send you my Fulbright application once I get it finished. Now, that what that says to you is, I was working on this in early spring. I started working on it in January. I started writing my project statement for that following year. It does take a long time to complete these applications and you need to have the time to get help if you need it. You need to really sort of do your uh, homework in terms of research and where you wanna be. If you end up in a place that's not something that you, that's you know just not working for you, you're screwed because you, you, you're kind of designated there, right? That's what you get. That's why you really do the research. Um, do as much as you can, talk to people from that institution, um, you know, uh, go to Facebook, go to uh, LinkedIn, try to talk to people about these things so that you don't end up at a place that you spent all this time for and all this effort and it's not the right place. So I said, if you cannot take me on, I completely understand. Or if Meiji University does not want me to be under their auspices, I understand that as well. Please do not feel badly if you must refuse me, but I hope it can work out since it would be really enjoyable and a great experience for me. So again, I'm giving her an out, I'm giving Meiji University an out so that they can save face. As you know, that's a big thing in Japan is face. So I'm giving them the out. I can't do it because I'm too busy. Uh, Meiji is not taking on any you know, scholars. I mean, there's a lot of ways that I've given her to let to get out. And so that's something that's really important. So I got back this, Meiji University, it's on letterhead. <laughs> it's, and because we're friends, I mean, I think she realized she didn't have to put much down. So all she says is, um, uh, Professor Fujimoto and Meiji University will welcome Professor Frenchie Lunning as a visiting scholar with a Fulbright grant from July 2020 to March 2021. Professor Fujimoto is a special expert of shoujo manga and recently doing uh, international Comparative Research of Manga Culture and Gender Studies. It must be a great project for us to collaborate on manga studies and to conduct archival research at the Yonazawa Yoshiro um, Memorial Library of Manga and Subcultures in Meiji University, because I had told her I wanted access to the library. So she's responding to that, just as Ellen told you. I believe our collaborative research will be fruitful. And she signed it, right? which she always signs with a little heart over the eye, so cute. And so this is the uh, library, right? And it's uh, filled with manga, so it was the perfect place. So I wanna talk a little bit um, also about the project statement. Very, very important. That is your ticket in, really, because this is how they find out who you are, what you wanna do, can you follow instructions and how well can you express yourself? Because this is very important to the Fulbright. So they start out, as you can see at the top here, and this is right off the application, uh, project statement addresses, and then it's got four points. But if you look there, they say, depending on grant activity for the selected for award, and then they have this little caveat for teaching specifically described 
And of course, mine was for research. And so you see what they did was they expanded these four questions to fit that situation. So what I did was literally as I was writing um, this thing, I, I literally crossed them off and made it very clear what I was writing. And I'm going to show you pieces so I can make that clear to you what I was doing. So this is right from the project statement. And I gave Ellen all my materials, my uh, application, my CV, everything, so that if you need something to look at, to sort of look at it, even though your, um, your introduction, what you want to do is totally different than what I'm doing, still look and see how I did it, right? So right away in the introduction, I did number one, what was the purpose? I will attempt research and write a book on the specific but not exclusive bulbs and tubers that are various tropes, historical locations, and the defining descriptions that are within my current reach. And then further down, I talk about it a little bit more. So right away in the introduction, I will attempt to research and write a book so that they know what's going on. And these um, bold, embolded things are in the actual paper, and you'll see that when you see that. So number two, proposed objectives, methods, and research styles. I propose to write a book, right? So they, I can tell them right away, text and image aspects of shoujo manga, shoujo manga in terms of time and space, Honda Masako's provocation, provocative notion of hira hira. Uh, number four is shoujo manga's queer family of forms and performances. Number five is shoujo scape as a rhizomic ecology of desire and how the theories of fictional modes of existence, um, uh, you know, express or expressed in shoujo manga. And they also ask you this key question, is your research qualitative or quantitative? And I don't know if Ellen or other speaker went through this or not, but that's a, a major question. So qualitative means that your research will be interviews, it will be um, reading research, it will be theories, it will be uh, quotations, it will be thoughts, it will be those kinds of things, uh, image reading and so forth. Quantitative are more like uh, anthropological or sociological or scientific where you will gather data and you will chart it to show your proof. So these are two kinds of research methods. I'm pretty damn sure that all of you who are watching this are going to be doing qualitative unless you're doing hard science, right? So um, that's what you do, right? And so qualitative uh, research method, and what I say is I just what I'm gonna do, using the research of shoujo manga in the manga museums in Kyoto, Tokyo, Book Off, which is this great cheapo book place, Mandarake stores, interviews with other shoujo scholars in Japan, some of whom I know, others who I've only read, and with fan and other non-scholar Japanese people. Also, visual research in the streets and shops, shoujo pilgrimage sites, fashions, and zoku, or tribal innovation. So there's a ton of stuff. My objectives are, they ask specifically for your objectives. I embolden the key moment uh, or the key statement, the deeper implications of shoujo culture, to write of the conceptual philosophical structures, to innovate theoretical formations, right? Those are the key things that are my objectives for that book. Number three, professional and academic context. So I explain, I've been working in this area for over 10 years, right? I just finished a book, so I have written one in the past. I know I can write another one, um, unfortunately. Uh, this book on Shoji will continue that exploration and expand the theories. It's a culmination of uh, my research since 2008 with my first Fulbright, so I let them know right away I've already had one. Number four, why? The significance for discipline, development, and Japan. Do not mi miss responding to the country of your choice and talking about why for them. What's the significance for them? That actually makes a big difference, not only in the Fulbright Committee, which that Fulbright Committee is in the United States. They okay you, and then they send your application to your country of choice for their choice, do they want you or not, right? So you have basically two decisions that are made. 
And then finally, five is methodology, logistics, time frame, and feasibility. So methodology to divide my research time between reading and writing at the manga museums with interviews and so forth. Um, I'm an old hand at using trains, subways, and buses and Google Maps for walking, and my Japanese is sufficient to survive in Japan, particularly in the bars and in the streets, but they don't need to know that. Uh, and then finally, why Japan? Political or cultural issues. And you have to be very straight up for understanding why. You can't bullshit this. This is something that you have to be very prepared to answer specifically. It must be Japan. Make uh, no wishy-washy language. Japan is ground zero for this phenomenon. It all starts there. Because um, if they can sort of, if you're sort of wishy-washy about why this country, they may say, yeah, we have too many people for that. Maybe you'd like to go to this place, right? Maybe you should go to Indonesia instead, right? For me, there is no other place. And that's what you have, for me, I had to make that very clear. Now, I know that one of the uh, people watching this is looking at two different countries. Then you would have to justify for both of those countries, okay? So results, uh, that's number seven, uh, to be disseminated and by my, uh, and my previous Fulbright grant. Um, I had to make it very clear to them that I had that. I didn't want them to think that I was trying to sneak in, though I wish I could. I start by saying that I do not want a flex grant. Flex grants are grants in which you can go, you have a nine month um, grant, but you can take it in chunks. You can come home for a couple months and go back. That's a flex grant. I didn't want that. I want to go there and just hang out for nine months. And I said, I'll be writing a book published hopefully by the University of Minnesota Press, uh, for which my previous Fulbright uh, grant was the origin and changed my life and uh, my lived and scholarly life forever. I saw, read, and discussed things about this culture I could never experience without the grant. And regardless of the outcome of this application, I remain eternally grateful. And I am. It changed my life. So are there any questions about this? I just had to rock it through that because I wanted to give you some question time. Thank you so much, Frenchie. If anybody wants to turn on their mic to answer or to ask a question, please feel free. You just click the little mic button and you can speak. Or if you prefer to type it into the chat box, I can read it aloud. Also, you know, I'm around, needless to say, with the virus thing, I'm way around. So if you need my help, I'm here for you. <laughs> You can always email me and I'll help you with your, your application. That's so generous, Frenchie. Thank you so much. Well, I mean, it'll give me something to keep from going insane here, <laughs> twisting around, you know. Gosh. Absolutely. Any questions? Yeah. I've got a question, Frenchie. Um, sure. And maybe, you answer, maybe you've mentioned this and I missed it, but I'm just curious after you, and I'm sure it's probably um, changed and it's maybe different at different times, but um, after you submit the um, application, the proposal, how long does it take before you hear back? They let you know it's usually um, about three or four months oh, okay. because they have a ton to go through. Right. And so they'll tell you it'll, you know, I think I put mine in in August and they told me that I would hear in December. And I did. I heard in December. So this is the other thing about writing ahead of time and realizing that your plans, um, you have to make your plans because, you know, the year that you're going for is the year that will start in after January, right? So if you, if you get back your response in December, you'll have like a month. If you were going to leave right away in, in January and you get it, you would have just a month to get ready. So you have to, uh, plan very carefully ahead. I had already figured out what to take in my bag and stuff like that. Um, you know, it's um, it's a it's about planning ahead. It really is. And plus, I had already had contacts. I already had speaking dates in Japan, which, needless to say, are all gone now because you know they're closed up as well. And Frenchie, um, it, we've got a yeah. question about. Um, can you clarify the specific type of grant this was for and which category? I'm mm -hmm. assuming it was the scholar. Is that right? Yes. Um, so this is a research grant. 
for a scholarly grant, right? This is not an artist grant. This was totally, uh, it's totally for scholars. Um, and by scholars, it can mean people right out of high school. Um, when I was there the first time, uh, the uh, Japan uh, Juzek, which is the Japan, um, you know, um, organization that takes care of the Fulbrights in Japan, wrote, emailed me and asked me if I would take care of two uh, high school Fulbright students who were studying in Kyoto. And so I met up with them and, uh, and I met up with them a lot. And one of them became a good friend. Um, yeah. And so it is a, a research grant. Now, research can have a lot of ending aspects. You can be doing research for an article. You can be doing research for an exhibition. You can be doing research for a lot of different things. It doesn't have to be a book. It can be, you know, if you have something that you're making that's big, then you can do research in that way. For art, I think it's a harder sell. They probably would want you to get um, more of the, um, go for more of the, I think it would still be research though. Isn't that right, Ellen? I mean, I've never gotten one like that, but isn't, don't they go for a research grant? They use the word research um, a little bit more broadly. So you might research a new method or a new conceptual topic or uh, something okay. like that. Um, but for the art ones, it's most important um, to expand upon your current practice in a yeah. feasible way. So they don't want you to repeat what you're doing in America. They right. just in another country, they actually want you to push yourself. Um, mm -hmm. But they still want you to keep it in the realm of feasibility. So if you're making a big medium jump, like if you're a painter, mm -hmm. and you want to start doing coding, or something mm -hmm. like that, like mm -hmm. that, that they would have questions about feasibility. Uh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. Well, I, my mentee is looking at this and, and um, that person um, is, is interested in a specific artist and would be do research by, you know, as looking to see if they can well, at least spend some time with that artist in the studio mm -hmm. or even just, you know, an inter a longish interview or maybe a couple of days even, right? Yep. Um, and then study that person's work. So I think that that's another way they can do research. Absolutely. Um, and I shared in the chat two, um, two art specific ones. So like mm -hmm. if you're creatively making versus um, writing or researching, uh, right. there's a painting one in the chat and there's a design uh, specific one in the chat. So you can check that out. What you'll notice is that it very much mirrors what Frenchie has gone over. Um, in the sections. Yeah, and you know, the, the, it is more about how you articulate your project. I mean, that's why that project statement is so essential because you can send that, if you can get it done ahead of time, you can send that to your recommenders. You can send that to your advisor that you're looking to help you get this um, place in the university or because, you know, sending it just to the university, your your letter can be sort of waylaid for God knows how long. And you, in, a, in a foreign country, you don't always know who handles that kind of thing in universities. So that's why I suggest looking at the professors, finding one that seems to be interesting, looking at their work and seeing if that person will be your advisor. And it is true, if you can find associated people, that's very helpful. For people wanting to go to Japan, let me know, or if you're doing something on manga or anime or any of the otaku categories, let me know. I know a lot of people in that area. I definitely will help hook you up with someone. That's how I got hooked up my first time. I, I didn't say that, but uh, the first time I, I was there in 2008, I um, wrote my friend Tom Lamar and I said, Tom, I need a, you know, an advisor in Japan. Who should I go to? And so I went to one of his best friends in Kyoto and he, this is another American studies guy and he's just a really great guy. I saw him once and he said, you know what you're doing, right? And so, you know, oh, oh we did go to, um, to Tokyo once, right? When Tom was there, the three of us went to Tokyo for a couple of days. But other than that, you know, um, he just, you know, he just let me do my thing. He gave, got me a desk. I had access to uh, Ritsume Khan's library and so forth. But Ritsume Khan was not where I wanted to go. And he knew that. He knew that what I really wanted to do was go to the manga museum. So um, I spent, I did spend some time in their library, but it didn't have enough stuff for me. So, you know, 
I didn't use my desk that much or anything like that. So it was basically, I used their Xerox machines. <laughs> I would bring stuff from other places in Xerox. But, you know, I mean, that's what, you know, it, you, you, uh, people, when they know you're a Fulbright student, that, that's cachet. And that allows you to move around a little bit more with a little bit more uh, um, freedom than you normally would as just a regular student, right? Because it does mean something to be a Fulbright scholar. Um, it gets you uh, in places. Um, the Manga Museum opened up like a melon for me. Um, I walked in, I had immediately got um, a, a, a year long uh, membership. I got um, full rights to the resource room. The resource librarian became one of my best friends there. We spent a lot of time there. She would go down and bring stuff up from the basement. It, 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 it's cachet. And so what I'm saying is, is that when you're choosing this person as an advisor, get somebody that you can work with that you know you can work with um and if you can tell by the tone of their letters be really front up about who you are what your plans are don't try to lie and say no i'm going to be a good doobie and come in every day and study if you're saying you know i'm studying fashion and i'm like going to go to you know shibuya all uh, you know half of the time to look at fashions on the street be front up about uh, up front about what you want to do because And I think uh, I'm hearing a pause right here. So it's Fulbright. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Great. Yeah, go ahead. Um, were there any other questions in our final minutes? Anyone? Yeah, because I can go on forever. <laughs> you all know that, and Ellen knows it very well. True. Um, no, it's, I'm not. Uh, sure it's uh, Sakura, else. by the way, now. So the cherry blossoms are here. Wonderful. So beautiful. What okay. were you going to say? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I have a question. Oh, good. Is that all right? Yeah, go right ahead. Yeah. If there's other people who are saying that at the same time. Sorry. Um, I uh, I guess one one uh, one comment I just feel is also just, I'd be remiss for not mentioning. It. I don't, you probably know about Nakano Broadway already, but there's a there's a mandorake on the fourth floor that yes. has the best collection of art books ever. Absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> Nakano is always at least two yeah. or three times right. I found the old um, 24 Nengumi sh um, shoujo manga there. Um, it is a um, pilgrimage to Nakano. Yeah, <laughs> I'm a going to pilgrimage. Know it. Yeah. Like, oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and my my question is is um, if you feel comfortable sharing with us like the amount that your grant was for and if, how you felt like how you navigated sort of the um, the ask and and the budgeting. Um, I'm trying to remember because obviously it didn't go, you know, things didn't go through this year, right? So it's like it stopped. Everything right. stopped. Um, when I was there the first time, it is a significant amount of money. They tell you in the, um, if you look in the uh, grant description, um, that's the key thing for you to like copy. I Xeroxed it. It gives you the amount of money they give you for different things. They give you um, a, um, a daily rate. They give you an apartment rate. They give you a food rate. They give you um, transportation. They give you the amount of money that they are giving you, and you add it up for the, for the full thing. So they, they tell you what they're going to give you. In that, in that uh, grant description, if you read down toward the bottom, it'll tell you exactly how much money they're going to give you. Okay. They, and it the, changes, you know, because I mean, I was there at a time when, you know, uh, the, um, the yen was pretty in pretty good shape. The second time, you know, the last time I was in Japan, I, I made out like a bandit because the dollar was better, right? So mm -hmm. um, it, it's, it changes. Uh, and so look for that. They will tell you exactly how much money they'll give you. And so they're calculating those things based on their database and that's then correct they're just yeah you know for that stuff. country yeah and it's Fantastic. the it's the country that's giving you the money it's not the fulbright the fulbright is just the operating mechanism by which these grants are dispersed but the grants are dispersed by the countries 
And so they will tell you how much they give you. That's a great question. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, it is. And I think it's one that concerns a lot of people considering the, the Fulbright in that um, yeah. we had that question last week about um, uh, just about what, what do you do? How do you maintain your life at home when you leave for six to 12 months? It's oh, expensive. Yeah. You know, it you is have to expensive. Yeah. You because, can... you know, yeah. they pay for everything while you're there. And Japan pays you very well, very, very graciously. Um, but, you know, somebody has to pay your rent. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, somebody has to drive your car once in a while so it doesn't die in the garage. Um, right. Somebody has to feed your plants. I mean, you have to realize that it is it's a major change. Yeah. Uh, and there, particularly for nine months. Definitely. And so I would recommend to thinking about that critically mm -hmm. as, as you're making your decision, because there's a lot of different options for the grants, um, and yes. to, including that flex grant, which mm -hmm. uh, for me personally is one that I've been sort of eyeing. Um, just out of practicality and that I yeah. can't really leave for a year. Um, it's not yes. possible with my job. So um, yeah, uh, I, I think that's something to consider as well. Well, and that's the thing is the job. See, so the, when I first went, I couldn't do it for the full time. I just couldn't because I had to be back to MCAT because I was not on sabbatical. I was at the end of my sabbatical. So I got one semester and the summer and then I had to come back. Yep. So I couldn't even, you know, use the full grant. Yep. Absolutely. Anyone yeah. else? Other questions? No? All right. Well, I want to respect everybody's time and um, thank you all so much. We will be posting the recording to um, the MCAD MFA website, similar to what we did with the first one. Um, so by the end of this three seminar series, we'll have a nice archive available. Um, that covers pretty much the whole process of doing the grant. So. Fantastic. Wow. And I'm, I remain open. Anybody just email me if you have problems. I can uh, have been through it a couple times. So it's, it's, I, I can help if you want me to. Wonderful. Thank you, Frenchie. And thank you, everyone. Yep.